everyone. Welcome to episode number 631 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. My podcast guests this week are Christian Hopemeyer and Thomas Metermeyer from Odoo Connectors. And we're talking all about high-speed data transmission and high-density fiber in aerospace applications. We discuss the biggest challenges in this arena, why reliable connector solutions can make all the difference in these types of designs, and the details of Odoo's rigorous testing techniques, which include something called the Arizona Dust Test. Also this week, I check out two new innovative methods to search for ice on the moon. So without further ado, please welcome Christian and Thomas to Fish Fry. Hi, Thomas. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello. And hi, Christian. Thank you for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so first, Thomas, we're talking all about high-speed data transmission in aerospace and reliable connector solutions in this arena. Now, before we dig into the details, what kind of challenges are you seeing, especially when it comes to high-density fiber in aerospace applications? Yeah, fiber solutions in aerospace applications are around for decades. And 20 plus years ago, there was always a problem with size as the only option where discrete fibers installed in large circular connectors. About 20, 25 years ago, this changed. A new high density fiber ferrule got introduced to the aerospace market. This so-called MT ferrule derived from MTP or MPO connectors, which got originally designed for connecting servers in big data centers. With this ferrule, it was all of a sudden possible to shrink the size of rugged fiber connectors drastically. But this came at a price. These MT ferrules were never designed for a harsh and rugged environment with many mating cycles. Therefore, they have a very high sensitivity to dust and dirt. And also the mating cycles are quite limited. I mean, just imagine, you need to clean these connectors after every mating cycle with some special equipment. And after just a few hundred mating cycles, you have to replace the whole connector completely. This is a huge price to pay for a much smaller solution. There are still engineers at prime manufacturers which hesitate till today to use fiber at all due to these shortcomings. Okay, so what kind of solutions should we be looking at to help solve these issues? And what kind of benefits does it bring? Well, so far, the industry was trapped in a catch-22. Either they use a physical contact fiber solution with a very small form factor, which comes with the before-mentioned shortcomings, so a lot of cleaning and low mating cycles, or they use an expanded beam solution, which diminishes some of these concerns, but at the same time has very bad insertion and return loss values, which are not acceptable for many applications. A few years ago, 3M came out with a revolutionary design of the ferrule. While also originally designed for large data centers, it addresses all the shortcomings mentioned before. 3M brands this design expanded beam optical, or short EBO. Not only is it even slightly smaller than known MT ferrules, it also has a revolutionary design which combines a high insensitivity to dust and dirt with excellent insertion and return loss values, which even outshine existing physical contact solutions in the market. In short, this disruptive technology is the answer to all the problems the industry has today. The ferrule is available in multi-mode as well as in single mode, and Odo is the first company to ruggedize this technology for aerospace requirements and introduce it to the market under our own expanded beam performance brand. Okay, so Christian, talk to me a bit about the rigorous testing you guys did with this solution. You did something called the Arizona Dust Test, is that correct? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it. 
we did some tests in which applies a thick layer of Arizona dust in open face of the connector. After that, we cleaned it with a few bursts of uh, compressed air. The tested values after that are the same as in new condition. So here's some numbers for the listeners which are deeper in these topics. The tested multimode ferrule had an insertion loss of 0.15 dB in original state and also after cleaning of the dust. Yeah, this is an extreme test. In most cases, you don't need to clean this ferrule at all. Okay, so tell me more about the cleaning and high mating cycles in general. Absolutely. We tested this ferrule far beyond 50,000 mating cycles. Yeah, that's far more the industry will ever need. But we wanted to see the limitations of this technology. While the typical insertion loss of our multimode ferrule is at 0.15 dB, the maximum per specification is 0.35 dB. This is still a great value for an expanded beam solution. Over the course of 50,000 mating cycles, none of these tested channels, and there are 12 per ferrule, went over these 0.35 dB. These are outstanding results in our opinion. And here comes the kicker. We did not clean the ferrules once during the entire test. Wow. Okay. So what kind of solutions do you guys have to support these kinds of designs? As Thomas mentioned earlier, we are offering some brand new ruggedized connectors, which include these ferrules. We just released to market our new series Odoo Tactics. Here you have a standard 3A999 Series 3 circular connector housing equipped with different numbers of these ferrules from 24 fibers within shell size 11 up to 96 fibers in a shell size 17. And all of that rated for a temperature from minus 65 up to plus 105 degrees Celsius. We also offer an array of backplane connectors for embedded systems. They are mainly used for connection between the modules and backplanes within a mission computer. And Odoo is also standardizing these solutions for the market. We just started two working groups within VIDA. These standards will be known as VIDA 95, for the circular, and VIDA 96 for the backplane solutions. Fantastic. Now, Thomas, what kind of specific applications would be a good fit here? Well, pretty much every fiber application in defense and aerospace which requires a ruggedized solution or where people are tired of cleaning all the time. Whether we talk about embedded computing application with port to backplane connection, or any I.O. connector on a mission computer or single board computer. But also any sensor which requires high data transmission, such as electro-optical and infrared systems, or also radar systems. The possibilities are really endless. Fantastic. All right. Well, Thomas, you're going to get my off-the-cuff question today. So, Thomas, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? Well, I live here in California, but you can hear from my accent that I'm still very much German, so it would be a Bavarian pork roast. Good choice. All right, Christian, how about you? Before you go, what would you have? Before I go, so let me think about it. So I'm located in Germany, and two weeks ago I was at the ETT meeting in San Antonio, and we had a really good brisket there. And we also tried to get some beef ribs, but they were sold out. So I would like to get some of these now. <laughs> very good choice, very. Very, very good good choice. (laughs) Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Thomas and Christian. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right, my friends. 
Let's head to the moon. In recent years, there has been a big push to determine where and how much ice is on the moon. Not only do we need it as a vital resource for a lunar base, it could also be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen to support humans and be used as key components in rocket fuel. And now, researchers have found two new innovative approaches to advance this quest to find ice on the moon. So, these approaches to find ice on the moon was built on previous research by assistant researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, Shuai Li, who detected water ice in the permanently shaded regions of the moon's north and south poles. A new study led by Jordan Ando, planetary sciences graduate student in Lee's laboratory, examined images from a specialized camera called Shadow Cam, which was on board the Korea Aerospace Research Institute Korea Lunar Pathfinder Orbiter. So, Shadow Cam is really cool. So, the polar regions of the moon receive no direct sunlight. So any sunlight that bounces off one side of the crater can indirectly illuminate the other side. And since Shadow Cam was designed to only look at the dark, shaded areas of the moon, it is very sensitive to that indirect light reflected off the surface of the moon. Ando describes the Shadow Cam research like this. Ice is generally brighter, that is, reflects more light than rocks. We analyzed high quality images from this sensitive camera to look really closely into the permanently shaded areas and investigate whether water ice in these regions leads to widespread brightening of the surface. So, while the ice in the shaded regions did not significantly brighten the surface, this team's analysis of the images from Shadow Cam did help refine the estimate of the amount of ice that could be on the lunar surface. Lee's previous method suggested that the lunar surface contains between 5 and 30 percent water ice. The analysis of shadow cam narrows that range, indicating that water ice makes up less than 20% of the lunar surface. Even further, another group of researchers at UH Manoa with HIGP and the Department of Physics and Astronomy recently published a study in Geophysical Research Letters that outlines a different and really interesting approach to find buried ice deposits on the moon's poles. Emily S. Costello, study lead author of the Associated Research, explains their new exploration method like this. With our recent study, we showed that a new technique for detecting buried water ice on the moon is possible using naturally occurring cosmic rays. These ultra-high energy cosmic rays strike the lunar surface and penetrate to the layers below. The rays emit radar waves that bounce off buried ice and rock layers, which we can use to infer what's below the surface. So, this team was able to use advanced computer simulation to test how radar waves travel through lunar soil to discover how much buried ice is below the surface. So right now, a team of researchers from HIGP and the Physics Department at UH Manoa are working to assemble a radar instrument that is specifically tuned to listen for these signals on the moon. And they are hoping to test this fully functional system by early 2026. 
After that, they will look for opportunities to send this system to the moon to potentially detect large deposits of buried water ice on the moon for the very first time. One of the co-authors of this study, who presented these findings at the recent Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Houston, Texas, explains how super cool this new research is. This method for searching for water ice on the moon is brand new and really exciting. Since it relies on high energy physics that only a few scientists in the world are experts in, even planetary scientists who are studying ways to find lunar water ice are often surprised when they hear about this technique. Really exciting, right? So, if you want even more information about these water ice on the moon studies or more information about Odoo connectors, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. <laughs> you can follow me or us on LinkedIn as well. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me, and our animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of May 9th, 2025, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.